so the first question, let's see if I can get this started. The first question really is what is deep, deep learning? I think now um, sort of, uh, so, uh, so, sort of, uh, sort of, as many people have already heard about deep learning or what it can be used for um, um, as a to determine, as a, to, 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 to determine, determine a three D structure with alpha fold to uh, to as a car that are driving by themselves. But effectively, how I see it is that if you think about something that you would have to do many, many times in order to become an expert. So that could, uh, that as a could, for example, be yellow playing golf. Um, as I'm not playing golf, but I just think it's a good example. So um, most people that play golf, I presume, are not as a solving all, all the underlying equation of motion before they do a swing. They have simply been training, they have been practicing, and they have learned to sort of read the environment and learn to read what parameters are important. Um, so this is what I then call, call, call as that the body has sort of learned and the body and the brain have learned to read the environment. And that is what we, we as a sometimes can as a call um, and as intuition. Now, um, in order to achieve that, we need to have excellent teachers. We also need a good brain so we can beat the environment. And then we need a lot of practice. And then there's another example, probably more sort of as a familiar to you, when we as a sit and, and as a write a new NMR pulse sequence, or we look at NMR data, it's not always that we will be solving all the underlying equations in order to predict what's happening. We can, of course, do so, but we have seen lots of examples and we have again learned to read the environment and we have built up this intuition um, simply just to do it, simply just analyze in the mass spec to look at them, see if they look good or not. So, to sort of recap, what we need, and that's the same for deep learning, we need a large and sophisticated, what I call brain. So something that can understand and read the environment. In deep learning language, that is either called a network graph or a, as a neural network as architecture. Then we need to optimize this, this deep neural network to do the job that we want it to do. And that is what we call training, where effectively we have some input in the end and then there will be some as output in the end. Sorry, some input in the beginning and some as output in the end. And we're then training our deep neural network to give us the desired, the desired as output when we have some input. Now, uh, very briefly, when we talk about deep neural networks, we will have many layers, so to speak. And it's sort of represented here. We would have an input layer that would take the data that you want to be analyzed. In between the input and the output will have a lot of as a hidden layers. They come in various flavors and I won't go into all the details. You might have heard some of those names like a convolutional layer, or linear layer and so on. Um, but for the sort of simplicity of this talk, uh, we can consider a simple linear layer that simply takes the input and multiplies it by a tensor or AS matrix and then it will apply a function that we call an activation function. Now, training the deep neural network essentially consists of, of finding these matrices or tensors P here that we multiply by the input. And that would just be for some linear layer, and the, but there will be other parameters for other layers. So effectively, we're doing a very big least squares fit, so to speak. It's a little bit different than the least squares fit, but effectively we will be as optimizing these P's, these um, P tensors, or also called the weight tensors, you might hear those words. So that would be the, the training. Now, typically, uh, deep neural networks would have lots of as parameters to be optimized. It can be on the order of a billions. So um, we would need a lot of training data. And that is probably the biggest hurdle 
for most machine learning and deep learning projects is really to get enough training data. Um, you might have seen sometimes when you go online, you will be asked to sort of verify you are a human by seeing if you have a chimney or a bus or a bridge. Now, that thing is merely just someone in the back that wants to train their own deep neural network, so they need some training data. You are then the person providing them with them. Of course, you have to do that, otherwise you can't access the homepage you're interested in. But the main hurdle to come back is really to find enough training data. And that's where or why we think deep learning has a very bright future within NMR. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But why is it that we think we can use deep learning for NMR and what sort of problems is it that, that we potentially can solve or can, can do with deep learning? If we remember, you can visualize any deep neural network as sort of pictured here on the right. You will have an input and then goes through all these various layers and then there will be an output. Now, the, the key is really that for a given input, you will always have the same output. Training it will then consist of you saying, if I have input A, I want a very desired output. And that is what the training is. Now, for NMR, what we have that most other fields don't have is that we truly have an in-depth understanding of the experiments we want to analyze. And that means that we understand most of the equations that dictate how, how the NMR signals behave, how the magnetization, how the density operators change with time within our sample. So what does that mean? That means that we can simulate very realistic data. And in turn, that means that we can create an unlimited amount of training data for any sort of deep learning uh, challenge we, uh, we, want, we want to do. So that's probably the biggest hurdle that most other fields can't just simulate data, but we can. And we can even add noise and other things. So it really looks like realistic data. Now, um, what one of the first tasks where deep learning and sort of biomolecular NMR was applied was to multidimensional NMR spectra. You probably already seen this or know this, but for, for, multidim for multidimensional NMR, for example, a 2D NMR spectra, we need to record a series of a 1D NMR spectra. So of course, if you want a high resolution in your indirect dimensions, you would need to measure a lot of 1D spectra. Um, in the same way for measuring or obtaining a 3 or 4D spectra, of course, the number of 1D spectra you would need to record to sample the full grid, so, uh, sort of as a Nyquist grid to do a Fourier transform will be huge. So over the last few decades um, in NMR, there has come a new technique instead of just recording the full uh, the fully sampled spectrum. So here's an example where the fully sampled spectrum, this is just an HSQC, a nitrogen proton correlation map, where we, where we have as a Fourier transformed in the proton dimension here on the x-axis. Then using what I call the 1822 um, as a Fourier transform. Actually, the Fourier transform was published about 200 years ago that then provides you with a 2D spectrum. And that's what we are used to look at in NMR. Now, if we, instead of recording all these slices along the, uh, the, the indirect dimension, but if we do what we call sparse sampling and just record a few of them and do a naive, just a simple Fourier transform, we see that this is not really representing the spectrum that we had before and it's not really good, good for much. So what we then need, if we want to use sparse sampling, we need to find a way instead of just a simple Fourier transform, where we can take these sparse data and transform them into a high resolution spectrum that we, that we want. Now, 
there are other ways that you can either reconstruct the missing points, as you see up here in this spectrum, we have taken points out that we haven't recorded, or you can otherwise analyze the spectra and find out the chemical shifts of the peaks in the spectrum. So let's have a little bit deeper look at this. So let's suppose that we, we, we only sample SP points. Here's one example of just a 1D NMR spectrum or FID, but that the fully sampled spectra would be NP. So a sparse sample SP would then mean that we have sampled less point than on the full grid. Sometimes it would be easy to get all the missing points, but for most of the cases that we really care about in NMR, we sample less than half of the number of points. Now that is notoriously an ill post problem because it brings us in that situation if we want to reconstruct the fully sampled spectrum that we need to determine more parameters than what we are provided with. So for example, if you have, have recorded 30% of your data, you then need to reconstruct perhaps 70% of the data, but you only have 30%. So that essentially uh, you want to determine more points than what you have obtained. So what we need to do, we need to either provide some additional information or some constraint in order to do that, or we need to, uh, to, to, to what I call as a narrow the vector space of allowed as a solution to this, this problem. And this problem, as you might guess, is very well suited for supervised deep learning because with the supervised deep learning we can as narrow the solution space such that there would not be just random points that we reconstruct but that any reconstruction must look like a as a, 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 as a realistic NMR spectrum. And true enough that was also one of the first cases in biomolecular NMR where deep learning was really being developed. So a simple example is here, how you would train your deep neural network. You would have a full FID, say that would be my desired output. And the input would then just be the sparsely sampled FID. Of course, you would not just give it one example. You would give it about a billion of these 1D spectra, and you would then train your deep neural network. What it will do in the end is effectively transform within this narrow search space of solution, it will transform the sparse sample data into the fully sampled sample data set. And the reason it can do that is that the only solutions that the deep neural network will have learned, so to speak, would only be those that corresponds to, to sort of a, sort of a realistic NMR spectrum. And there have been a few studies shown uh, where deep neural networks have been developed to do this task. And they sort of vary in a little bit in the way they're done, but very similar. Um, some work on the time domain, some work on the frequency domain. Um, the main difference is that the, the net graph or the deep neural network architecture is, is quite different between these studies. There are three of them listed here. Um, they all give sort of similar-ish results showing that as long as you have enough training data and as long as your deep neural network, your net graph is big enough, is diverse enough, then you can train your deep neural network to do this re reconstruction. Now, today, what I will mainly focus on is the last one. It's a deep neural network that was developed in my group uh, last year, which we call FID net. And that with that network, we have tried to take one step further, uh, which I will also try to emphasize that we can also train deep neural network, not only to provide an answer. So not only to reconstruct the sparsely sampled spectra, but we can also train them to provide us um, and as uncertainty. So not only reconstructing the data, but also telling the user um, how well have these data been reconstructed and where in the spectrum is it that you would expect artifacts and, and so on. 
So as I said, over the last, last two years, there have been quite a few neural network developed, many of them indeed on, on sparse sample data. Uh, but many of them, still a bit, is considered or presented as a proof of concept, proof of principles, and have sort of suffered a bit from as a generality. So that means they have mainly worked on on as a situation that were, that they were trained at. Um, and of course, this is a little bit of a sort of, sort of as a philosophical uh, question, but it is properly that these deep, deep neural networks is, are, are like a highly advanced interpolators. So what, what do I mean with that? So consider this situation here, that you have a training set, which would consist of sometimes an open hand and sometimes a closed hand. And then you have your deep neural network learn from those two pictures. Very narrow case, of course, normally you have, have billions of cases, but let's just for simplicity. What I mean by advanced interpolation is that your deep neural network could potentially on unknown data give you an answer like this here, which is an overlay or between an open and a closed hand. Us as humans knows that what lies in between an open and closed hand is more likely something with a hand that is half opened. So that's what we mean when we say we would like these deep neural networks to start to learn to analyze NMR spectra, try to learn to learn how they change over time and what sort of a structure they will have. And to do that, that was when we started to look at this FID net, uh, the FID net architecture. I'm not going to go into all the details and all the all the equations, but very briefly, why we did that is that it originates from an architecture called WaveNet, which was which was originally developed by DeepMind to look at at voice audio. Now. Um, FIDs are very similar to NS audio signals. So therefore we thought that using some of the ideas from this wave net here would, would be quite good for analyzing and also transforming NMR spectra. So what's uh, the special thing about this FID net and, and wave net that is that it, it, uses a, it uses as convolutional layers but not just standard convolutional layers, it uses what we call as a dilated convolutional layers. I'm gonna give a brief introduction to that. But a standard convolutional layer would have a kernel of a certain size, and it will then loop over the, the FID. Here's an FID that has been sparsely sampled. The thing is with NMR signal, and especially the, the time domain signal, that the information is not as a concentrated in a narrow range. So if you have an NMR signal, the information will be spread out over the entire FID. So that would mean to analyze that, we would effectively need to look at a big chunk, if not the entire FID in, in one go. Now that would, would create uh, um, as convolutional layers that with kernels so big that they won't fit into any computer anywhere. And we are therefore using what is called a dilation, that, um, as convolutional layer. So what is that? That means that you have a convolutional layer with holes in it. So here you have a dilation of one, that means it's not dilated. Then you have a dilation rate of two, that means you have one hole in it and so on. Stacking all these dilated layers on top of each other effectively gives you a layer with a huge range. So it can span the entire FID. And here is how we have then, then sort of put them together. Again, this is with inspiration from DeepMind's uh, wave net. So effectively we make blocks of the different dilated layers, and then we sum them all up in, in the end. Here's one example um, where we have a methyl trosy spectra of a 50 kilodalton enzyme as a H stack eight. And 
This up here in purple is as a fully sampled uh, methyl trosy spectra, while in green, we have taken a rather sparsely sampled spectrum, so only sampled 12.5% of the 1D spectra in, in, in as a carbon dimension in the indirect dimension, and then we had reconstructed it with FID net. These ones were, were sort of further complicated by the fact that they did not start at time zero. This FID net has learned both cases, so it hasn't started at time zero, but the first point in the carbon indirect dimension starts at one over two sweet width. That means you would typically see that when you process NMR data that you need to apply a, a, a as a first order as a phase correction of 180 degree. Now, FID net, uh, reconstruct spectra as good, if not better, than the traditional tools such as SMILE and, and as IST. Um, and it's, it's very robust and very flexible. Now, what is the key here, what we think at this point for sure, is that there are really no parameters for the user to optimize. Remember what I said initially, when you have a deep neural network, um, that for a given input, there's only one output. So that means when you use these tools as a user in a more user, um, there will be no, uh, no as a parameters for you to optimize. This program or this network just takes one input and that is your sparsely sampled NMR data. And with that, it provides one output, which is a reconstructed spectrum. Here's a comparison with SMILE and HM, um, as HMS, IST, and you see that they perform sort of very similar, slightly better with FID net. But what is uh, another key point here is that we, we have also with using deep learning and FID net, we have the ability to look at the uncertainty. We run this deep neural network as a sliding window over the spectrum, that means that each sort of slice in the spectrum will be transformed about four times. That allows us to get the uncertainty with which this network can reconstruct spe spectra. And here in red is shown as the uncertainty that, that we get. So why is that important? That's very important if you look at, for example, a NOSI spectrum and you are have a highly sparsely sampled data set that have been reconstructed. You look at a little peak and you are in doubt. Is this peak re, uh, uh, real or is it a reconstruction artifact? Now with this tool here, it gives you at least an idea if you see a huge red uncertainty on top of the peak that you are curious about, maybe you should be extra careful while if the underlying uncertainty is very low, you can probably trust that that, that peak is a, is a real real peak, or if it was a nose spectra, a real NOE that you can use in your structure, structure determination. So that was one, one task, that of sparsely sampled data. And I think that's probably how a lot of deep learning in biomolecular NMR has, has started. But if we think the idea that for any input, we can just train it to give another output, as long as the data really has the required information. So another task we went on to was that of as a homonuclear decoupling. And why that? Because that is often notoriously very difficult to obtain with pulsing techniques. Um, for example, if you have carbon-carbon coupling, also proton-proton coupling, they will generally evolve during your during, during, uh, acquisition. And we were then curious, can we use deep learning to decouple these spectra? Are there really enough information in them? So let me show a few examples where we show this is indeed the case. So here we trained FID net to decouple carbon carbon couplings in an in an as a HNCA. So that would be C alpha C beta couplings. 
Now, remember, it's not all peaks that would have scalar couplings. In this case, in an HNCA spectra, some of the peaks, like those from glycines, would be singlet. So the deep neural net would need to learn that if it sees a singlet, it should do nothing, while if it sees a doublet, it should be decoupled. So we trained FID net, in, in this case, not to do reconstruction of, of sparsely sampled spectra, but simply to do decoupling. So here is one example. Here's an experimental spectrum. I should say that what we do when we do the training, again, we use about a billion spectra. They are all as a synthetically generated. So purely synthetic data on training. And then we, we test it on real experimental data. Let's zoom in here and you can see in, in blue, we have a standard HNCA run with high resolution. You see doublets. Let me focus this one here. Right, there's a doublet after FID net. It has been fully decoupled. Now that gives you, of course, much, much sharper peaks. That led us to, if we can do decoupling, carbon-carbon uh, decoupling, that will then mean when we record carbon detected spectra, there, some of the big challenges also carbon carbon coupling that not only gives line broadening but also doubles the amount of peaks you have. So here's here's one example. If we just do a very very simple 2D carbon carbon spectrum, this case of as a valine, you will then see that each peak here essentially would be a doublet, and that is when we record the C gamma carbons. Each of those would be coupled to the C beta, so they would all give a doublet. Now, previously, also in the in the con experiment or the CON experiment, we get around this um, this artifact or this this coupling by recording what is called as IPAP. So we would typically record two sets of spectra: one where the two peaks of the multiplet would be in phase and another spectrum where the two peaks would be as antiphase. We'll then take some and differences and move them around to get one, one single peak. But can we, can we train uh, FID net to just do the decoupling? That will save us a lot of time because we would only need to record half the spectrum. So here is the example. We trained FID net to do the decoupling. And as you can see, just visually here, it does a very good job. Every, every doublet here is transformed into a singlet. So effectively saving us half, half the time of the, the experiments. And here's a comparison. That would be the in-phase spectrum. You see doublets. If we were to record the classical IPAP, here we measure up, 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 down, sum and differences and move them. You then get a singlet peak, of course, but require double the amount of time. And here's a comparison with FID net where we get a singlet spectrum in, in sort of one, one shot. Now, not only does that here allow us to skip one spectrum, we only record one spectrum, but it also means that we have the potential to make other pulse sequences shorter. Simply because if we don't need to do IPAP, we can eliminate a, a big a big part of, of the pulse sequence. So let me show you an example of that. That would be that of recording C alpha spectra. So C alpha direct detected spectra in, 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 a, in a proteins. So those C alphas are coupled to generally to two carbons, that of the C beta with a coupling of around 30 Hertz and that to the CO of a larger coupling of around 55 Hertz. And what if we record such a spectrum, just acquire and do an indirect detection and then do a direct detection in C alpha, we will see that each peak, here's a slice of a 2D spectrum, but each peak would sort of be um, four sub peaks. So it would be down, down, up, up, and you see that for all of them. Previous methods rely on what was called a DIPAP, not IPAP, which is up, up, and up, down, but a DIPAP where we would have four different combinations. Um, 
it is possible, you see, if we record all of these different different possibilities, so if app, so antiphase in phase, if if app app and if app, and we then take some and differences and move the spectrum around, we can get a singlet in many cases. However, we need to record four different spectra and we would have to add this huge DIPAP block to the NMR pulse sequence, which adds around 150% extra time, where of course we will have relaxation so forth. The other challenge with the DIPAP is that not all amino acids are the same. So whereas we have many amino acids or some amino acid with a C alpha and a C beta, some of them don't have a C beta, for example, glycine, some of them will have a C beta at a similar chemical shift as the C alpha. And that means we cannot do the DIPAP because we cannot apply selective pulses. So you see where this is leading leads us to the, the, the question, can we just use deep learning? Can we use FIDNet to transform, in this case, not sparsely sampled data, not a, not a simple doublet, but this, this sort of funky pattern here, which would be four sub peaks with down, down, up, up, but transform that into a singlet. So in this case, if I deem it every time it will see this pattern, it will exchange it for a simple singlet. So that's that's what we, we did. We trained FIDNet again on fully synthetic data, but um, on synthetic data where it was a C alpha detected data and the C alpha could be coupled to both C beta C O or could be coupled to just the C O in case it was a glycine. Again, this the training used probably about, about a billion spectra, uh, took a few weeks, but once it, it was done training, we could start to feed it experimental spectra. And the deep neural network doesn't really care if the nearby C beta has the same chemical shift as the C alpha. It gives a doublet, and that is the feature that FIDNet has learned learn to recognize. So let me show some experimental data comparison. So on the left here, you see the classical COCA carbon detected spectrum where we have used DIPAP. So we need to record four spectra and you see some residues gives a few artifacts of so the glycines, threonine, and serines and so on. Whereas on the right, we have the FIDNet decoupled home or as virtual decoupled spectrum where all of the peaks are singlets. Key is we only recorded one spectrum, whereas on the left we, previously we need to record four. And on top of that, if we look into the sort of challenging residues, which was normally be very, very hard to study. So serine and glycine, you can see that uh, even with recording four spectra using DIPAP, uh, the peak shape is not great, doesn't work in DIPAP, whereas FIDNet doesn't really care if it's a serine or threonine because it has learned the pattern and it therefore makes a nice singlet out of it. So that's what we generally do since this is a tutorial. Uh, what we always do, we will train all our data on fully, fully as a synthetic data. However, try and make the synthetic data as realistic as possible. So we would add noise. And if there are any artifacts that we are aware of, so if it's a proton detected, we would have a big, big solvent water signal. We would add that to the training data too. Anything we, anything we can think of that we know would, would create small artifact in the spectrum we're trying to take into account in the simulated data. Um, but then in the end, we will always aim, strive to see how these neural networks are working on real life scenario. In this case, it would be a C alpha CO. And I think this is probably a good time to take a short moment if there are any questions. You can see there's something in the chat, but that's not questions. So I don't know if there are any questions. I'm happy to, to answer some now, or if we should shall continue on. What, what's your opinion, Blake? If anyone has any questions, they can enter them into the Q&A. Uh, right now, we don't have any questions in the Q&A. Okay, 
I can't. We can pause. Know. We can pause um, for just a moment, but. Uh, yeah. I see one now. Yes. So I have a. We have a question um, from Lucas in the in the Q and A. Question is: Are the decoupled spectra suitable for re relaxation? Hey Lucas, good to see you. Uh, I I strongly strongly believe so. We haven't we haven't tested it yet. Um, now what we have tested is that we get um, as intensities that that represent the real underlying intensity of the signal. I think when Luke was Lucas mean is suitable for relaxation that that um, if you're determining T1, T2 or CPMG or SES, in those cases, what you really rely on is to have accurate intensities of the cross piece. Again, you would then use those intensities to get your rate or whatever downstream. Now, we haven't directly tested this on relaxation experiments, but what we what we have tested is that you get intensities out that are that are very very good agreement with with what we would expect. You see, Ruth is asking. Great. Yes, we have a question from Ruth Pritchard. How does variation in line width affect the reconstruction? Uh, very very good question. So as long as we have have trained the deep neural network. Um, so it has, has seen, for example, either very, very skinny peak or very broad peaks. Um, then the reconstruction um, fidelity, the reconstruction quality uh, is, is good. Um, FIDNet is quite robust. So if, let's say, we train it on a, on a semi-narrow range of line width, but we ask it to reconstruct the spectrum with peaks that are significantly broader or significantly sharper, it, it typically do a, will do a decent job. Um, in other words, it doesn't completely give up. Old versions, my own included from 2019, uh, was not as robust. So if, if the spectral parameters varied significantly from what it was trained on, it sort of gave up and created artifacts. So the original Great. alignment is preserved as well. Yeah, the original line with is preserved, yeah. Great. So we have another question from uh, Shankarama. People are still apprehensive of using such a black box model from their perspective, at least it's a black box. How do we convince researchers to use deep neural network models? Yeah, you bring up a very, sort of philosophical good very good good point here now in in my view these deep neural networks are are not black boxes they're probably as far as you can ever get from a black box because if you have the time and really want to you can go in and see every single multiplication every single thing done to your data now, why it's doing it, that is then a question, but it is very, a very open box because you can see exactly what happens in every single step. Also, with one given input, there is only one output. Whereas if you are doing classical, what I would say classical analysis, least squares fitting, sometimes the least squares fitting strongly depend on your starting parameters. It depends on a lot of other parameters that the user has chosen to use to find the minimum. And you might not always find the, uh, the global minimum or the same minimum as, as your friend who is sitting two seats down in the office. So I actually think that these are not black boxes. I think it's, it's a bit, I don't think it's the right word for deep neural networks because you do know exactly what's happened and is reproducible. I don't know if that will convince other people, but that's my, my view. Uh, we have a question from Franz Mulder. Can you also make the net do desired rather than realistic processing? For example, can it learn to line narrow the peaks or can it learn to denoise spectra? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, on as long, 
as long as the information is there. We have trained some of our deep neural net to, um, um, to narrow the peaks. So for example, you have in the process spectrum that, that will have half, half the line width of what came in. Um, and then there's a denoising, or oh, I should say with the line narrowing, of course, there's a, there's a limit, limit to this. Deep le learning can only do it if it has enough information to do it. Now that information can be highly entangled, uh, but the information needs to be there. So if your peak relaxes in like half a millisecond, um, and you want it to make it just one hertz wide, it, it's probably not going to work. But if the information is there, it, it can do it. When it comes to denoising, uh, another very important point, um, spectra that are processed with deep neural networks uh, show things that might look a little bit like noise. Now, that is not noise. Um, it is it is originating from uh, um, artifacts through the deep neural network. So yeah, um, if the deep neural network knows what it's doing, and let's say you have a simple spectrum to reconstruct with a few number of peaks, since we train our deep neural net to always produce noiseless data, it inherently would try to denoise it as well. Um, and the hard thing, for those reconstructed or transformed data set, whatever is really to judge uh, what is the uncertainty, what is the noise, because with any non-linear transformation, if T is linear, but deep neural networks are not, um, you will have artifacts that are not to be seen as noise. And that's why we are putting so much effort into making the deep neural network also predict its uncertainty with which you can determine the parameters. Yeah, so I give very long answer. I don't know if we've run out of time before, but let's go. Uh, Manuel. Yeah, so I think the next question is a good follow-up actually to where, to where you ended. So Manuel asks, uh, different regions in the decoupled spectrum in the 1D slice you showed uh, have different noise, while the noise in the experimental spectrum seems constant. Do you have any thoughts about where this noise comes from and is it due to proximity to regions containing signal or something else? Uh, that is exactly what I, I was talking about, that what looks like noise, we really have to be careful. And what is, I think he means here, right? Um, where this part has very little noise. And then there's something that looks a bit like noise here, but it's probably more of a little bit of an artifact. So it's really artifacts we're looking at here. And that's why um, having the uncertainty measure that if ID provides via the sliding window in this case uh, is very important. And that's there is, of course, a correlation between the artifacts we see and the uncertainty, but the, the artifacts we see are not a true representation of, of the noise. Yeah. Sometimes you might see a sort of denoised spectrum where it, it's just flat, there's no noise, nothing. Now that does not mean that you could not have a tiny little peak that in your real spectrum was just above the noise, uh, in just in the noise, but that you don't see in the transformed spectrum. Yeah, so we have a couple more questions, um, but I would suggest that we, we continue on with, uh, with, the, with your tutorial and then we can answer some of the, the remaining questions at the end. How does that sound? Sounds good. Good. So. Now, what the first part was really about transforming NMR spectra. So we have an input, something, sparse data, coupled data, and then we want to change those NMR data to either decouple or reconstruct them. Now, there's another very important aspect of NMR, and that is that of analysis. And um, it's not always trivial. As many of you might know, um, analyzing in particular relaxation experiment as Lucas brought up, uh, CPMG relaxation dispersion, test or cest or other things that report on dynamics and other things can be rather, rather challenging. So what we have been working on are deep neural networks that can analyze the data for you autonomously. And 
to start that, we we chose what we thought was probably one of the most tricky thing to analyze. Doesn't mean that it's not a good experiment. It's a very good experiment, but it's it's rather a a, a bit tricky to to analyze. And that is that of the proton cest. Many of you might have heard cest very briefly. It's used to to study low populated states. And with with cest. Um, we apply a weak, weak as a B1 field, and we can then see if we, in this case here, have a blip here. That means that there's a low populated state with a chemical shift around that, that position. Now, what makes proton cest um, harder to analyze than conventional cest is that the way we record it or has to be recorded creates this sort of anti-phase uh, the features in the in the cess profiles and that makes analysis somewhat harder um so what what we thought initially as a very first step we thought these cests here are hard to analyze can we at least can we at least just decouple them because if we think about these are not, not as Lorentzian signals but they look a little bit like peaks. Um, so our first thought was, can we can we train FID net to to decouple at least decouple these cest profiles here? Because if we have them decoupled, then it should be possible for most people that can analyze traditional cest to also analyze these these here um, proton cest cest data. Now the challenge is when we start looking into it that cest data are typically or cis profiles are typically recorded with a different number of points um, and that num different number of points depends on on many many factors such as your magnet biggest your magnet um, what b1 field do you use for the saturation etc etc and the challenge really uh, to then put these cess data into into deep neural networks is that deep neural networks typically take a fixed size input. Remember, it takes an input, creates an output, but the input needs to be a fixed size. <coughs> but what we realized is that CES profiles, although recorded with a different amount of points and a different spacing between the points, the points are typically recorded on a grid, on a regular grid. So that means the spacing between the frequency saturation points is the same. Now that means that we can do a Fourier transform. This would really create what would be a sort of time domain cest, which is slightly artificial because cest is really recorded in the frequency domain by saturating at various frequencies, but Nevertheless, we can call it a time domain cest by just doing a Fourier transform. What we see here is that not surprising because cest looks like peaks. Therefore, the Fourier transform would look a little bit like an FID. And that is also the case. It actually looks like an antiphase FID. Remember, it's a bit like a sine, sine function. Now, important thing is here, that 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 time domain says that this FID like time domain says the case to zero, and we can then let zero fill it like we would zero fill any other NMR data. Why is that important? That's important because now we can take any cess curve, we can Fourier transform it as long as it's recorded on a regular grid, and we can zero fill it to a fixed size that can then be used as input for our FID net. And then the FID net's job in this case would then be to decouple this antiphase. We know that FID net can decouple um, when we had the C alpha detected spectra. So we thought this, this might be possible. So here are lots of parameters. I don't want you to remember all of them, but just to show you the sort of way that we simulate data. So we have proteins with lots of different sizes from four to 25 nanosecond populations of the exchanging states varies between 1 and 10 percent, rates vary, spectrometer varies, and so on. The input points also vary. Sometimes we 
pretend we have only recorded 50 points and sometimes up to 128. Whereas always the target, so the output that we want FIDNet to create is always consisting on, of 128 points. So it will do an as opt sampling of the SIS data. So here's the flow because if IDNet is designed to work on time domain, we do a real Fourier transform, we get what looks like a FID antiphase. We then use the deep neural net FID net here to decouple it. And then we do an inverse real Fourier transform. And then we have a CES profile that looks like a typical CES profile. So sort of a decoupled one that one can analyze with, with standard means. So let's see how it's, it's doing. So this is standard RMSD. So that means when it does that decoupling, remember these are fully synthetic data. These are 100,000 synthetic data and nevertheless synthetic data. The RMSD is about 1%. I think that's, that's pretty good. And it's very robust here with respect to various parameters, respect to the population of the low populated state, the strength of the B1 field, the exchange rate, you see RMSD is roughly constant. And what probably is, what to me was one of the most interesting thing is that it is really uh, very robust with respect to the number of points that you have sampling. So the op sampling is extremely robust. Now think back where you saw the Fourier transform says looks like an FID. So it's not really surprising that you can op sample it because most of the information is already gone. We have another paper about that if you're very interested in the nitty gritty detail. So again, we apply it to experimental data. Here is an example from T4 lysozyme at 800 megahertz or 18.8 Tesla magnet. And we see that it is doing what we think is a good job in decoupling. Now, the problem here is that we can do the decoupling, but we don't have a means of checking, cross-validating how good has this decoupling really been. If we then sit back and we look at this peak here, and we think that, well, there's already been deep neural networks that can distinguish between a dog and a cat, and they can drive a car. Um, we felt quite confident that another deep neural network should be able to figure out where the peaks are. So that's what we set for. We set for to develop a second deep neural network that could be stacked on top of the the decoupling network to then figure out where are the chemical shifts of the exchanging sites. We went one step further here and said, not only do we want it to tell, tell us where the chemical shifts are, but we really want it to give us also an uncertainty. Remember uncertainty is key. Any scientist that gets a number without an uncertainty would probably not trust it. So we want this deep neural network to not only tell us where are the exchanging uh, species, the chemical shifts of the exchanging species, but we also want to tell us how well has it done that. Those of you who have done a bit of machine learning, we put it into the loss function. So we ask it in the loss function to optimize both the uncertainty as well as the predicted chemical shift. So let's see how it's, it's doing. So now here is the, the workflow. We first take the ANSI phase says, we do real Fourier transform, decouple it, inverse Fourier transform, and then we determine the chemical shift with the last layer. And here are real experimental data um, for T4 lysozyme where we have one slice here. This is slice number 12. We really actually recorded 86 cess point in the frequency domain. We then determined the chemical shift of the exchanging species. And then we thought, well, we saw that this network was very robust with respect to a uh, number of points. So we can properly do this similar analysis with half the number of points. So we removed just half the points and put the, those half the points into the network again. And true enough, what you see is that we get very similar answers. And these answers agrees with each other within the uncertainties that the network has predicted. You see that it predicts very small uncertainties. So it's doing a quite, <coughs> a quite accurate determination. We can then compare the chemical shifts we got from 
43 points and 86 points. And we see that they agree really well, both for the ground state and for the sparsely populated state. We see the RMSD of this correlation plot is very similar to the uncertainties that the deep neural network had predicted. So that shows us not only does the, this deep neural network now in a, in a one shot analysis, analyze your assess data, it also knows how well it's doing. Uh, and give you the uncertainty on, on those chemical shifts. So let's see another uh, proof of that. So if you plot here the confidence, it's another measure of the uncertainty. Confidence of one means that it's absolutely sure. Confidence of zero means that it has no clue what it's doing. So you see a very good correlation between the differences that it between the 43 and 86 points analysis and the confidence level, the higher confidence, low uncertainty, and low confidence, we have a higher uncertainty. So that's quite good agreement. Now we then set forward to test one more thing experimentally, and that's when we teamed up with Urin, who uh, developed um, the protein test initially in the group of Lewis K to analyze these data and with the traditional uh, tools of least squares fitting. So, urine analyzed and did the least squares fitting, got chemical shifts out for all the ground state and, and low populated states. Remember, this is using a uh, two experiment at, at 42 Hertz B1 field and also at about 20 Hertz B1 field. And then we took one of those data set, ran it through our autonomous deep neural network to predict both chemical shift and uncertainties. And you see a very strong correlation, actually uh, nearly, bang on, uh, the RMSD between those two analyses, the one uh, carried out completely independently on the other side of the world using least squares fitting and the one done in our lab using the deep neural network agrees with an RMSD again of around six, seven PPB. So about six in a thousand PPM, which is exactly what the deep neural network predicted it could do. So, where are we and where are we going next? Well, we can do lots of things. This is just to give you a little bit of flavor. Um, as long as we can describe our problem where we have some input and we want a, a desired output and that the information is in the input. Information can be highly entangled as long as the information is there and you can create enough training data, then you can develop a deep neural network to fish out that information you want. So clearly the next thing would be potentially CPMG and all other NMR experiments that are very hard or challenging to analyze. Because remember again, with deep neural networks, there are really no parameters for the end user to play with. Might seem a bit boring to many NMR spectroscopists that there's just one input and therefore one output. But I, I think that is a quite important thing for making uh, NMR easier easier to use and to analyze. This autonomous analysis of CES data, there are no parameters for the end user. They give the CES data and then out comes all the chemical shifts with the uncertainties. So my advice to all of you, since it's clear that we can analyze experimental NMR data with, with deep neural networks, we can transform them. So for all of you, be creative, be bold, ask a lot of questions. What would you like to do? Uh, there are now lots of packages available to do deep learning. We use TensorFlow, but there are other, other tools. Uh, Torch is another one, another other thing. So if you are interested, uh, go ahead. You can download our, our neural networks from GitHub. All of the things are there for you to play with if you want. Um, so. Go ahead, try it. So in the end, a big thanks to Noskal and NMR Box. Those were the groups, the people that made me think initially of deep learning and NMR. Uh, my, my postdoc or postdoc in my group, uh, Gox, uh, you can go to his, uh, his uh, GitHub where all our deep neural networks are there. Some people for, for giving us money. And if there are any more questions, happy, happy to talk more about, about it. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for a really excellent tutorial um, and for explaining all these things. We do have a few more questions, uh, some from earlier, and then we have a few extra. Okay. So we can start with a question from Lucas. How specific are the neural networks to the biomolecule they are designed for? Can you use these decoupled neural networks designed for proteins on, say, RNA or DNA? So, again, good good question. I, I think they could. So, for example, the carbon decoupling neural network, we, we trained on... So for the carbon carbon spectra, there you have a coupling of around 40, oh, sorry, uh, 35 hertz. They were trained on a slightly broader range from about plus minus uh, seven hertz around that. So anything that falls within that range, it should, should work. So if you have an aliphatic carbon carbon coupling, that's typically the same whether in a protein or, or not. Now, if you start to deviate a lot from, from those parameters that the network has been trained on, I would suggest that the network gets retrained for that specific case. Um, so it all depends how, how far away are you really from, from, from what it, it has been trained on. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have a question from Mark Bostock. Uh, is your sparse data reconstruction agnostic to the sample schedule pattern, uh, or do you see a dependence, as with other more traditional reconstruction methods, on the particular uh, sampling schedule? Very good question, Mark. Thank you. Um, so, the first uh, neural network that I developed a few years ago, we only trained. Uh, I only trained it on on just one sampling schedule, and it is very clear. There's a Another recent paper on bioarchive bias of Vladislav's group shows that if you only use one sampling schedule, the search space is much, much smaller and you get much better performance of your neural network. Now, our goal with FIDNet was really to make it more robust. So to, to allow it to analyze any, any sampling, sampling schedule. Um, in in the supporting material of FID net paper, we have we have tried to go quite far both in in terms of of sampling uh, sampling rate. Uh, it does deteriorate a bit. We trained it around twelve and a half, and if you go down to 10, 6 percent, it starts to deteriorate, going higher. It does not really improve the result much. So maybe some extra training training there could could help. Yeah. So there is a big question: If should we aim at just one sampling schedule? Now that depends on the problem and on the spectrum you're you're looking at, of course. But if IDNet is quite robust, great. We have a question from an anonymous attendee: uh, What challenges are there when deep neural networks uh, are presented with real data that was taken under different experimental conditions like pH, for example, that may not have been taken into account while training and what needs to be done to apply deep neural networks for studying biological uh, activates using RTNMR? Very, very good, good question. So the, the earlier architectures were what I call it very, very picky. So if the data you you wanted them to analyze were quite different from what they were trained on, they would typically create a lot of artifacts. And um, which is a problem. Now, the newer networks, and again, if I net is quite robust. So if things varies from the training data that you have used, it typically does not get completely thrown off or get thrown off. Um, now, the big question is how, how, how big a variation? So when we train our deep neural networks, we would train it on a broader range than what we would think we would normally observe experimentally. Now, you, you mentioned pH. There's typically not much changing with pH uh, for the spectrum we have looked at. Um, now, that could be line width if you have exchange with water or something like that, line broadening in the HSQC. In H2 groups that are exchanging could get very broad if that's what you're thinking about. 
Now, what needs to be done? Well, it's probably an, an iterative process that we will train it, try to be as good as possible, thinking about all the artifacts we could have in an NMR spectrum, all the, the ranges of parameters we could have, and then train it on that. If we then go ahead and we use our deep neural network and we consistently see that there's a problem with a certain group of signals, certain group of cross peaks, we would of course try to think why is it that there might be a problem here and then we would retrain it with once we have identified what the problem is to come back again that is really why it's important to have the uncertainty so we know what that now it, if it doesn't do a good job maybe in the future the deep neural network would just go over and retrain itself if it finds out it needs something else but we haven't come to that point Great, thank you. Uh, so we have a, a, a question that follows up nicely on where you ended there from Ri Wei, uh, Huang. What a fantastic talk. Thank you, Fleming. Thank you. I'm wondering Ruth. if you can elaborate, I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little more on how you use sliding windows to assess uncertainties in the reconstruction. Ah, good point. Yeah, I didn't go into all those details, didn't have time. So so what we do with with FID net and a sliding window is that we we take we take four slices in, it can be any number. We choose four, or sometimes seven, but we typically use four. So we take four carbon slices into the network that will then be either decoupled or reconstructed or transformed together to generate another four. So four in and four out. Now that we use over a sliding window of the whole spectrum. The idea of using four initially was that there is, of course, a correlation between near, nearby spectra, nearby points. So by having them having four in together gives you much higher accuracy. Using a sliding window then means that each carbon spectrum, if it is a carbon HSQC or something, if you decouple a carbon spectrum, each carbon 1D slice will then be transformed four times, once on the right side of the sliding window, two in the middle, and once on the left side of the sliding window when you slide through. So that means it gets transformed four times. What we have then done with here in FIDNet, the, the decoupling version is that we take the mean and the standard deviation over those four independently processed data. It's true, it's the same neural network you go into, but depending whether you go in on the left or the right side of the sliding window, the data runs through a different path within the deep neural network. It gets activated by different, different parts of, of the neural network. And those are sort of semi-independent uh, for transformations. Hopefully that makes sense. Otherwise, let me know. Great, thank you. Uh, so I, I, have a, I have a question. Um, what uh, th this type of analysis with deep neural networks, uh, can it be used to inform, to going backwards, inform um, experimental design to, to tell us something about how to optimize our experiments or optimize our parameters to get better results or more consistent results? I hope so. That's my, that's my whole goal that you, so for example, with the DIPAP, um, there's a, a quite substantial gain in signal to noise by completely omitting this long DIPAP block. Um, so by, by combining the development of the neural networks with the pulse sequence design, in, in this case, it was a substantial shortening of the sequence, which gives much higher signal to noise. Now, we, it also allowed us then to see, see, see as a serine and threonine that we otherwise could not see, but it was really this interplay between the two. Um, now, how else can it in, inform you? There are other branches of, of AI, like as a reinforcement learning that we start started, um, where the neural network would, a bit like Google's car, would learn how to drive. Um, these agents can learn how to, to do NMR. Uh, 
They might do it very differently than me. I don't know yet. Sometimes they do it a bit differently. Sometimes they do similar things. But um, I think it's really initially this combination where we would go back and forth and see how can we create data with higher signal to noise, although the data might be highly entangled. Um, I think traditionally in our, our head, we have had that we want there to be singlet peaks coming out of the spectrometer. In phase, singlet peaks, no overlap. That's our ideal scenario. Now, it could easily be that you would have much more information, much better signal to noise by not having singlet peaks coming out of your spectrometer. So for example, with the DIPAP, where we have much higher signal to noise, and then the deep neural network can still easily, easily process it. So I think it's really this going back and forth and knowing more importantly, what is it we would, we would like to learn what is what parameters is it we care about in the end.